Hoosier Hospitality Craft Beer is made possible in part by VisitBloomington.com. Bloomington is home to two breweries, Upland Brewing Company and Bloomington Brewing Company, as well as many other unique restaurants, shops, hotels, festivals, and events. Information on this and more at VisitBloomington.com. And from Best Beers Incorporated and Hoosier Street Specialties. Locally owned Indiana businesses that distribute beers from around the world, including craft beers from Upland Brewery and the Bloomington Brewing Company, reminding viewers to please drink responsibly. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Hello, I'm Anita Johnson, and welcome to Hoosier Hospitality Craft Beer. You know, the state of Indiana has a rich heritage of brewing beer dating all the way back to the 1800s. And now, Craft beer is thriving again in the Hoosier State. In this program, we'll visit several of the more than 30 breweries and microbreweries in our Hoosier State. We'll take you inside the 20-year-old Broad Ripple Brew Pub in Indianapolis, Three Floyds in Munster, and Upland in Bloomington to get up close and personal with these unique and one-of-a-kind breweries. We'll also learn tips and insights on what ingredients go into craft beer, what foods to pair with beer, and how to get started brewing your own beer at home. These, plus some interesting stories from both professional brewers and everyday enthusiasts from across our state. So, let's get started. There's one theory that humans first gathered in villages to brew beer. You know, which came first? We needed to drink beer to live together or we gathered together to drink beer? They started finding Chinese vessels that are extremely ancient with traces of beer. And Babylonia, Egypt, they all have major beer cultures. In the early days of the Republic, America was really a whiskey drinking society. And many of our founding fathers, notably Sam Adams, were also brewers. And it was considered a health drink. It was considered a much better drink compared to spirits and whiskey and rum. Indiana has a remarkable history of brewing that goes from its earliest days through hundreds of breweries that were scattered all over the state and then a massive consolidation where we ended up with gargantuan industrial complexes in various parts of the state. Cook down in Evansville, breweries up in South Bend, Old Crown in Fort Wayne. In the mid-19th century, up to Prohibition, the heyday of Indiana locally brewed beer, you have a broad range of people that were going to taverns and to beer gardens. We had beer gardens all over the state. In that period, Hoosiers were drinking about 15 and a half gallons of beer per capita. Prohibition came early to Indiana. April 2nd, 1918, the day that that passed, 31 breweries closed their doors and 3,520 taverns. April 7, 1933 was a pretty giddy day in Indiana because it's the first day that we could have legal 3.2 beer. They were literally tracking beer trucks coming from Milwaukee, coming from St. Louis, and uh, there would be bulletins that would be broadcast, and the hope was is they could get beer trucks to Indianapolis by lunchtime. By 1934, there were 16 breweries in operation in Indiana, and they brewed 714,000 barrels of beer that year, which would have been 8.2 gallons per capita. We drank a lot of beer that year. In the post-war era, the 40s, 50s, 60s, where you saw massive consolidations and buyouts of local breweries, regional breweries, the product began to be blander and blander, less and less flavorful, lighter and lighter, and that was the style the people wanted. But we 
ended up getting a product that was, in my estimation, not as good as it was. And we had some famous brands like Champagne Velvet that was brewed in Terre Haute that had a national following. That was a nice beer, it was a nice crisp, light beer. But as we moved into the 60s and 70s, there was a rediscovery of, uh, let's say, more authentic beers, more traditional beers, and that's where you see the rise of the craft industry. Our first stop, just off the Monon Trail at the Broad Ripple Brew Pub, or more commonly known as the Brew Pub. Literally hand-built by owner John Hill, the brew pub has been serving up classic British ales for more than 20 years. Hey there, Billy. Hey, Anita. How are you? Good. How are you? Hi. What can I get for you? I'd love a stout off the hand pull, please. Sure. You know, the brew pub has such, a, such an English feel. Mm -hmm. You dispense beer a little differently here. Uh, yeah, this is a, a hand pull or a beer engine. This is um, a typical way of uh, dispensing beer in England. The, the main difference between this and, uh, say, one of these taps is that uh, those are pushed by gas like um, uh, CO2 or, in our case, a CO2 and nitrogen uh, combination. These, these hand pulls, as you're pulling it through, a bellows kind of sucks the beer through and agitates it. So you see it. Uh, You've got a nice head on it, but not a, a, a whole lot of carbonation. So it's, um, it pours a perfect pint. We brew standard English beers, and um, that's the best way to pour them, with uh, less carbonation. I noticed the, the glassware is different, too. Uh, yeah, this is your, your standard uh, imperial pint glass, which is 20 ounces, as opposed to 16 ounces, that you, um, which is an American pint. And uh, what's special about this glass is a little bump, which when you're holding it, if I could steal your pint for a second, it won't slip out of your hand as easily. And the other thing is that if you're a bartender, you pour it there and you've got a half pint. You know, this is a gorgeous back bar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this again was a, a, a salvaged piece which was uh, put together and uh, John built around it. He's a carpenter by trade so that uh, it again looks like it was there forever. And uh, same with the bar. The bar, it, it looks old, and I mean, it's all, you know, it's got nice wearing on it. Billy, there are a couple other rooms here at the brew pub. Show me around a little bit. Sure, let's go. So, yeah. what's this room, Billy? Uh, this is a room that the staff call the family room. And uh, the reason it's called the family room is because uh, once upon a time, uh, these doors represented the, the edge of the, the pub, and outside was our outside cafe. Mm -hmm. We added on to it. Um, quite a few years ago now, but uh, so this is still called a family room when even though there's plenty of other places for families to eat. These cabinets and uh, all the woodwork you see were, were, were um, created by John. It, it looks like it's, again, like it's been here forever. Billy, no English pub would be without a dart room. That's true, and ours has one too. Fantastic. So like give, to come this way, give me I'll... a tour. Sure. <laughs> here is promised is our dart room. Wow, the first thing I notice is it's not electronic. Uh, no, these are uh, your traditional dart boards. Uh, that was very important to us. We didn't want, you know, electronic. It's, it's not the same thing. Right. And uh, for a long time, there wasn't room in the pub until we added on. Ah, and yeah. one of the things John wanted to do was, uh, was a dart room. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and here it is. Well, that's fantastic. Hey, the pub has a wonderful English feel. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. You know, Nita. congratulations on your 20th anniversary. Yeah, and uh, we look forward to the next 20. Fantastic. I grew up in England, and um, you know, I'm fortunately able to build these places myself. So I can build it exactly what I knew from when I was a boy. Uh, and I say a boy because we drink a little earlier in England. Uh, and so I was able to create uh, a pub like uh, that I wanted. Uh, so it would be like back home. So basically, you're right. If you were, if we were Star Trek and we could zap you back to England, you'd close your eyes, you'd think you were still in the pub. We have regulars and people get together, and, and it's like an extension of your living room is what it is. And I think that's my, my side of a perfect pub. The whole idea is you come into a pub and you pick yourself a beer that you like, and you pretty much drink that same beer all the time. And, and, and the conversation is the main stay of the pub. So you, you know you're going to get a good beer. 
then you're going to get good conversation. So that's my philosophy on drinking beer. In 2010, we had our 20 year anniversary on November 14th, which was, we enjoyed that a lot because we had our old brewer came back from 1990. It was hard work, I know that. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it, yeah. I mean, I, I, I know what else to say about it. It was a, it was a thoroughly enjoyable uh, uh, day. We bring all our grain in from England, and I make beer that was available when I, in the 60s, when I left England. It's a little stronger, uh, a little higher in alcohol than, than American beers. It's actually higher in alcohol now than English beers are because we get taxed differently over here than they do in England. In England, they get they get taxed on the, the alcohol content of the beer. So the beers over there, have pretty much, they taste the same. However, there's uh, less uh, alcohol in them now. Unfortunately, pubs like mine in England now are closing, you know, something like 30 a week or something like that because the, uh, the younger people over there don't appreciate the conversation, but they just want loud bars with lots of televisions in them. So uh, it's, it's unfortunate. L luckily for me, my village is still got the old pub still there. So. Well, we, you know, we were the first in the state to win a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival. And we went the second year and we put the same beer in and didn't win anything, so we said, heck with that, I'm not going back anymore. Now we, we don't win as much because we've got a whole bunch of competition now. There was nobody around when I was winning, so maybe that's why we won, I don't know. <laughs> I started this business and never homebrewed at all, but I drank a lot, you know, so I knew exactly what it tasted like. You know, I think my expertise was that I knew exactly what the beer tasted like, whereas back then people who were starting breweries wanted to brew English beer, really had only tried it in a bottle or had been in England for a week. You just don't quite, you know, you just don't quite get it. So my beers were experience, I guess. To our location and the fact that we're set back on the on the land and people haven't seen us or know that we're here, there's a lot of unbelievable. Most people still don't know we're here, uh, <laughs> and, there's and no we haven't advertised the fact that we are here. <laughs> here is a plot of land just outside Brazil, Indiana, home to Frank and Julie Forrester, a few cattle, and Bee Creek Brewery, which is kind of perfect because Bee Creek started out like a lot of Indiana's breweries, at home with Julie's brother, Mark. I was a home brewer for quite a few years. I started you know, when I was in the service in the Navy and just kind of did it pretty much sporadically. I wasn't really hardcore like a lot of people are um, nowadays. I never really cared for craft beer. It's kind of hoppy, a little bit different. Frank and Julie you know, were always you know, Budweiser Coors drinkers like you know, most, most Americans. Once you learn to appreciate craft beer and start to like it, the rest of it tastes like water. And that's really kind of what got the whole ball really rolling. It was mostly working on the weekends. Every Saturday we would brew, sometimes two batches on Saturdays. We had a small system that we started up with that really could only make at most you know, about 10 gallons of beer at a time. We we're out in our pole barn. There was no heat out there. You know, we'd be hovered around a little propane heater. I remember being out there just freezing to death. Those are distant memories now. Bee Creek's still in the same pole barn but the brewery inside has expanded significantly. Well, there's so much different equipment out there when you look at it. Yeah, we wanted the bigger, shinier, you know, <laughs> nice looking equipment. Some of it's very pretty. But I we mean, didn't... works of art, that's not ours. We bought a used microbrewery system from a bar in Sacramento that went out of business and had it shipped out here. And That one fit everything we needed. It had the bright tanks, fermenters, Water, tongue, and kettle. It's an honest to God hodgepodge of stuff. <laughs> a fair amount of it's literally homemade. When we unloaded this big pile of stuff that we had no idea, there's, oh, there was a thousand valves, and we just said, I, I don't know what to do with any of those. <laughs> but luckily, the Forsters knew Mike Godsey. So I called Mike just to come over and look at it and see what he thought, and uh, he kind of fell in love with it right from the start. He's kind of taken over everything with me working full time. I taught him how to brew. He does all the brewing, um, all the maintenance stuff. He's just really been great. Currently, Bee Creek is a production only facility. Liquor stores and restaurants are the only places to find their signature brews. Among them, Hoosier Honey Wheat, Bee Creek's most popular recipe. 
which means they need honey, a lot of honey. When we first started the honey, we, we did not, we were not using Martinsville honey. And when we decided that, yeah, we're going to label this and, you know, when we were talking about buying that much honey, we wanted to go with someone local. The local connection for our brewery is, uh, is very important. Not only our ingredients, but even our packaging. We always try to get that local wherever possible. Not only is it the right thing to do, it makes good business sense, you know, because you know, Budweiser, Coors, all those breweries are always going to be hundreds of times larger than we'll ever be. But the one thing we can do that they never can is to have everything local. But what it all boils down to for Bee Creek is the beer. I don't know, I mean, sure how to explain the feeling that your beer is out there and people like it. It's just a, it gives you a very positive outlook on the brewery through the struggles of the initial starting and things you go through and you wonder, are we the only ones that like the beer? So once it gets out there and you get all the feedback at the festivals and people really like it, it's a rewarding feeling. I mean, that's our goal, is that people like our beer. Hi, I'm Clay with Sun King Brewing Company in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm here with your first lesson to tell you about the four ingredients that we use to craft beer. Beer is made from all natural ingredients, water, cereal grains, hops, and yeast. Water is one of the most important ingredients in beer. We treat local water with uh, different brewing salts or phosphoric acid in order to match the style of water from places like England, Belgium, uh, Germany, uh, East Coast, West Coast. Different places have different water chemistries and those different water chemistries are going to dramatically affect the flavors that you're going to get from beer. We take our water, we heat it, and we add hot water to cereal grains. The same base malt, which gives you your fermentable sugars, can then be toasted, which adds uh, a rich caramel-like color to it. Um, there are multiple different levels of toasting, all the way up to roasting, which gives you uh, a grain that uh, almost has a coffee-like color and bitterness to it, like coffee beans. We create a sugar water, and then we move it over into a brew kettle, and we boil it. The boiling process is when we add hops. Hops have oil glands, and oil and water don't mix unless you boil them. So by boiling, we leach out the oils from the hops, and those oils mix in and help balance out the sweetness of the sugar water that we created earlier on in the process. Hops are added at three separate times and add bitterness, flavor, and aroma to beer. Once you add those hops, you've created a nice diet for the final ingredient, which is the living ingredient of beer, yeast. Um, yeast is a fungus called Saccharomyces, and its main job when put into environment with food is to eat that food, and the eating of the food is called fermentation. During the fermentation process, the yeast actually take what we have made as a diet and turn that into the delicious beverage that you know and love. I'll be back in a bit for lesson two. Our next stop, Northwest Indiana, the region, Munster to be more specific, home to Three Floyds Brewing Company, makers of Alpha King, Robert the Bruce, and the infamous Dark Lord. Three Floyds is routinely rated as one of the best breweries not just in Indiana, but the world. Morning, Barton. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. What's going on today? Well, I was just labeling Ronnie James Dio. But other than that, we're uh, making some beer and, you know, what's doing our the, thing. What's in the boiler? Right now we're making Gumball Head, uh -huh. which is um, what we make a lot of. <laughs> that and Elf King, those are two main brands. Those seem to be uh, cult favorites. Well, they certainly are. And uh, we try to intersperse that with a lot of different seasonals and, uh, you know, other strange stuff that, uh, you know, people when they travel here, they can come get and, you know, just stuff for the local market. So is this uh, what's going on in the brewery this afternoon? This is organized chaos. <laughs> this is, uh, each one of these circles represents um, a different one of our tanks. And so this is kind of how we keep track. A brewery is an industrial operation just like anything else. So we have to keep track of everything and we generally use dry erase to do our weekly schedule and then keep track of what's in our tanks and what's going on. Fantastic, well, show me around a little bit. Absolutely. Cool. Whoa, what is that? Uh, these are the offices. 
Really? It's uh, two shipping containers. Uh-huh. It's a fairly affordable way of housing yourself. <laughs> so what's the saying across the top? Death to false prophets. Really? Yeah. Okay, so tell me about that. What's that mean? Well, to us, if you're not going to be fully invested in making the right thing, mm -hmm. making good beer, the best beer you possibly can, not cutting corners, you know, use best ingredients, all that, what, why do it? And those are the false prophets. The people out there, they're going to sell you swag mm -hmm. and uh, claim that it's, uh, that it's a good beer. Hey, we've got one more thing, one more stop to see. All right. Take me over and show me. This is Nematron, the rock and roll robot of annihilation. <laughs> So Barnaby, this is uh, the Nematron. This is Nematron, the rock and roll robot of Annihilation. It keeps morale up in the brewery. It's not too bad. We got a couple features here. First of all, it's painted like the Bismarck, the, uh, well, you know, one of the great dreadnoughts. Uh, we got a couple lights here. And like I said, keeps morale up. Show us what it'll do. I will show you right now. That's what it does. <laughs> there you have it. One more stop. We got to go over and see Adam in the kegging line. Absolutely. Adam, our spokesmodel, uh -huh. and he's way more handsome than I am, so <laughs> you'll enjoy his company. Thanks for having us. Oh, today. my pleasure. So, Adam, what's going on here? Oh, just finished filling the keg. Really? Mm -hmm. All right, so are you the guy in charge of how to get the beer in the keg? Yes, I'm in charge of the kegging line here. So, what goes on here? Well, the keg line basically, when we get the kegs back from a pub, um, mm -hmm. we can't just put straight beer back into them because they have someone else's beer and they could be dirty. We don't know how long they've sitting around for. So we have to put them on this machine, which in three stages cleans them and then refills them. Uh huh. So we can send them back out. Fantastic. So, about how many kegs do you do a day? Generally 100 on the average day. Uh, that sounds like back breaking work. It's not too bad. Wow. Right now, it's only running about half the speed that it can. So. In about a year from now, I think we'll be running about maybe 200 kegs a day. So Adam, thanks a lot for your time and keep those kegs rolling. My pleasure, you? my pleasure. Through the internet, it's kind of like a silent uh, salesman. It drives people here from all over the country that uh, beer enthusiasts, home brewers, probably half the beer we have here is just made for a Three Floyds Brew Pub. A lot of one-off beers are available here, so it makes it a destination. Try to make the best beer uh, we can. The best ingredients, try to use the best yeast, the best malt, the best techniques. I mean, it's a brewery founded by a brewer for brewers, so um, most of the beers we make don't fit into any um, style category. Whether they're too big or too hoppy, too alcoholic, you just make, you know, what, what you want. Yeah, it's uh, the one day a year um, you can buy Dark Lord in bottles, which is our uh, big uh, Russian Imperial Stout. And all around it's a festival. You can bring your own beer, taste beer from all over the country, listen to bands, and if you want to, you can buy Dark Lord. Part music, part beer geek, and part beer tasting, so kind of a hybrid. It's amazing. <laughs> we try to uh, make the best beer possible, so we try to use and propagate the best art we could find or the weirdest art we could find. None of our art is normal. Some is graffiti art, some are tattoo art, some is like street art. We're always mixing it up with different artists and different, different graphic styles. Keep it not normal, basically. There's not much room to grow the pub. It is what it is, um, 75 seats. But brewery's got 10,000 square feet. We could still grow. That's the uh, horse that pulls the wagon. <laughs> Women were doing the brewing, you know, before men were ever doing it, and I like to think that that's the main reason that the uh, craft is still around. Started out home brewing. It's something that uh, 
I just, I fell in love with. I do remember my first batch of homebrew. It was an IPA uh, called Shakedown, and I don't really remember how it turned out or tasting it. I just remember falling in love with homebrewing when I first started. It was my passion, for sure. was given the opportunity of a professional brewer almost 18 years ago. I literally did go knocking on the five brewery doors in Eugene and said, hey, my name's Liz. Um, do you want to hire me? I'll wash your kegs for free, just like everyone says. I'll, I'll uh, you know, make keg deliveries, whatever you need. And they didn't bite on that. But they bid on, you know, after winning some awards and getting certified in the beer judging. It took me about a year knocking on uh, three different breweries doors and finally got hired in as assistant at Steelhead. Rock Bottom is the largest brew pub restaurant chain in the U.S. Each individual location has their own brewery and their own brewer. The recipes here at College Park are my recipes. They're not corporate recipes, which is great. It gives us brewers a chance to be creative, artistic, but also really dial into your local clientele. And that local clientele is drinking award-winning beer. In 2010, Liz took home the silver medal at the Great American Beer Festival for her Naked Oatmeal Stout. It's amazing. I mean, to, to win one of those awards is, I would say, the ultimate for a professional brewer. I'm what you would consider a purist. I like to make styles that are true and uh, it's, it's a whole lot harder to me to make a beer that's true to style than it is to basically make a new style up or just do something crazy. The Pink Boots Society. Uh, Terry Ferrendorf started that. It's women from all sources of the brewing industry. Marketing, selling beer, distributing beer, brewing beer, cellaring, you name it, beer is their world. So 500 active members in the last four years is pretty amazing, all over the world. We're all in this together. We're a, such a small part of the, the, the big game that um, we need to stick together. There are very few female brewers in the industry. It's, it's definitely male dominated. To be a female brewer in the state is an honor. I've never looked at it as a challenge. It's something that I love to do and um, I've never let anything hold me back. To me, it's my world, it's my life, it's who I am, it's who I've become. And I love a good beer. We believe that it is the preferred package, and it's the package of the future. Cans can go places that bottles certainly can't. For example, on the west side of our fair city, there's this large oval where people drive fast and turn left, and cans can go out there as opposed to bottles. That's right, he said cans. Craft beer and cans started in 2002 with Colorado's Oscar Blues, and several breweries across Indiana are following their lead. Sun King is canning versus bottling for a couple of different reasons. Cans are the perfect vessel for containing beer in. If you think about it, they're sort of mini kegs, if you will. So there's no uh, UV light penetration, which is one of the spoilers for beer. And then secondly, the lid on it, you can exert so much more force when you have metal on metal, so you have a more integral seal than you do metal on glass bottle. So no oxygen pickup. They also happen to be lighter weight, uh, so you have less of a carbon footprint because it takes less energy to transport them around. And Sun King is not alone. In addition to kegs and growlers, Great Crescent Brewery in Aurora is working to add a canning line to their operation, albeit on a slightly smaller scale. We have a two-head manual filler and then a manual uh, can seamer. It works real well as far as uh, test cans. I'm sure based on our 
previous experience around here, there's more to come. <laughs> I guess the reason why um, craft brewers have bottled as opposed to canning is because it doesn't take as much money to get into bottling. There are lots of smaller, older bottling lines that you can pick up off the internet uh, for relatively you know, cheap. You can buy just a pallet of bottles and you can hand label them and you, boom, you're in a small package. But for canning, um, you have to buy a semi-load, which is over 100,000 cans per, and that becomes a little cost prohibitive for the average uh, craft brewer. The artwork on a can is not any different than getting a label approved for anything else. What we decided to do was just carry on with the same philosophy we use on our growlers. We had one growler printed and then we stick the style on there and it goes out the door that way. So we're having one can printed and then we have a, an outline box and we're going to put a label in there depending on what the beer is that we package. And for those who would argue that the beer suffers, Dave and Dan say it's all about perception. The cans are lined, so there is no contact with the beer to the actual aluminum. Because you put your mouth on the uncoated aluminum and draw that metallic taste in, and you assume that it's coming from the beer inside when it's actually coming from you. So the best thing for canned beer is to be poured into a glass. There's a lot of good craft beers out there. There's 60, 70 craft beers now in a can. And to be honest with you, None of our customers have had a negative opinion about a can. When we first started the idea of canning, it was basically because we really felt strongly about the package and we also coincidentally like to go places and we like to have our beer with us. So I've had people send pictures back from beaches outside of the state. I just imagine them to be everywhere, one day on the moon. Welcome to Lesson 2, everybody. I'm here at Backyard in Broad Ripple with my friend, Chef JJ. Uh, JJ and I work uh, year-round. We do about four different beer and food pairing dinners every year, and uh, JJ's really done a great job of honing his palate and uh, putting together not only cooking with beer, but pairing with beer. Hi, JJ. Hi, how's it going? Great. Excellent. We're gonna talk about uh, cooking with beer first. And the first thing I want to do is show you a brine with beer. Uh, brining a protein is, is really good for holding in moisture and adding specific flavors. And then using beer instead of water also adds those specific characters of the beer. So a good base brine is going to be uh, equal parts of uh, kosher salt and brown sugar. And then a little bit of uh, pickling spice. And pickling spice is used to add a lot of different characters to the protein and also uh, help preserve it a little bit. And it has juniper berries, uh, grains of paradise, some uh, dried bay leaves, and also some cinnamon and nutmeg. And then we're going to mix that all together, traditionally with warm water, and it would dissolve all of that and, and pull out the aromatics. But in this case, we're actually going to use beer. What kind of beer are we using today? What style? Uh, this style of beer is a wheat beer. Um, and wheat beers are really, really nice because they um, tend to transfer a lot, of, uh, a lot of the same characteristics that are transferred uh, with the pickling spice. So we'll use that to add to our liquid. And we'll simply dissolve this liquid. Awesome, thank you. So now, depending on what style of beer you like, you could really use any beer. Correct. That's the great thing about a brine is you really could use any single beer you wanted. Um, depending on what your end product you wants to be uh, is, is going to be what you're starting with. So with this particular type of beer, having those citrus elements and having that clove element, uh, it'll really transfer nicely to uh, the pork tenderloin that we're going to do. So now once this is done, we're going to actually put it in a pan and soak or brine the, exactly. the pork? Exactly. We'll, uh, we'll marinate the uh, pork tenderloin. Uh, in the brine for anywhere between two and four hours. Uh, we'll let the salt and sugar uh, create the osmosis which helps, uh, which helps the protein stay nice and moist and then we'll remove it from that brine and uh, grill it directly. So when it comes to pairing food with beer, uh, you really have lots of options and you uh, can really um, do whatever is most comfortable with your own personal palate. 
darker beers will be more apt to go with uh, heavier flavored foods and smokier flavored foods, whereas the lighter beers you'll be able to utilize more in marinades, lighter sauces and salad dressings. But really the sky's the limit as far as the different variety of beer uh, that you can use and the different varieties of beers that you can match to your food. Let's get out there and start cooking. Our final stop, Bloomington's Upland Brewing Company. With their flagship Wheat Ale, Upland has been converting factory beer fans since 1998. But the attention they've received recently is for something decidedly different. Hey Caleb, what's going on? Hi Anita, uh, just taking some samples of our sour ale line. Oh really? So what are you making here? What kinds of things? Uh, most of what you see behind us is uh, the Upland Lambics. So we have a little smattering of all kinds of things in here. So. Tell the viewers a little bit about a Lambic. Lambics involve uh, other microorganisms not normally involved in uh, regular brewing processes. So the wild yeasts are involved, Britannomyces, as well as some lactic acid bacteria. Lambics are actually one of the oldest uh, accepted beer styles, uh, over 500 years uh, of constant production of them in Belgium. What you find in them is uh, generally very tart uh, type beers to different extremes, as well as uh, Britannomyces itself likes to produce a lot of uh, horsey, uh, leathery uh, kind of characteristics. Um, so they're kind of their own little unique uh, Belgian-inspired uh, beers that we do. What started as kind of an experiment with just, uh, just four of these barrels has grown over the years um, into something that we, we think we do pretty well and uh, we get a lot of attention for it. I think these end up all across the country? Yeah, all across the world. <laughs> so I've seen people have reviewed our Lambics in Denmark and Sweden and uh, a guy actually physically drove down from Quebec to pick them up one year. So Caleb, I hear you've got a brand new big tank. Yes, Gigantor. Oh, you got to show us that. That's right next to Olga. All right, let's go. <laughs> wow. Oh, there it so is. So there it is. Yeah. That's enormous. How many barrels is that? Uh, that's a 150 barrel fermenter. How many times do you have to uh, brew to fill that thing up? We have to do four batches on our brew house behind us here uh, to top off Gigantor. So what goes in here? So far we've used it uh, solely for Upland Wheat, which is our flagship beer. Does it stick out of the roof? Yeah, it sticks out of the top of the roof four feet. Um, it's actually kind of perfect. We can walk up there and uh, any of the fittings on top that we need to get to, we can walk right up and uh, remove those as we clean or uh, inspect them as needed. Caleb, thanks so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Glad you could come down. I don't think there is just a typical Upland customer, right? Because we brew a very broad range of styles, some of which appeal to a very mainstream beer drinker, some of which appeal to the, you know, big hop heads out there. The wonderful thing about being in college towns, number one, we have a a slightly more educated and, and worldly population here and so they have been exposed to beers outside of the mainstream American beers for a long time. We don't do traditional business planning I suppose as they teach it in a business school. We brew the beers that our, our brewing team is excited about brewing as opposed to you know, doing some sort of market analysis and saying there's an opportunity for a beer that looks like this and tastes like that and then let's go make it. I suppose five years ago we thought about becoming more of a regional brewer. In the last few years we've really focused on being much more of a local uh, Indiana brewery. Why I don't think craft beer is a fad is because I've yet to meet anyone in my lifetime who was a craft beer drinker to a domestic light lager drinker. 
I think it's got legs. At the end of the day, for the craft breweries to be successful, there have to be more craft beer drinkers. Will the people of Indiana try craft beers and will they like them? And if so, we'll be successful as a business, we'll be successful as an industry, and I think that's happening. People think a lot more about what beers they're drinking, and I think that has made it harder for the big national breweries to differentiate and that the difference in those three beers is not the beer as much as it is the advertising campaigns that say that their beers are different but they really aren't all that different. It may not be the most important thing, but every homebrew club needs a name. So, what do you get when you combine a metrologist, an engineer, a chemist, and an academic? Who all happen to love brewing beer? It was almost Acme. It was very close to being Acme. There's not too many places you could go with those four letters, but we ended up being Mecca. Mecca is a homebrew club with members from across Indiana. They frequently meet just outside of Shelbyville in their semi-official clubhouse, Bill's Pole Barn. It's just a bunch of guys who like to make beer and we all get together and make beer under the same roof. A lot of your homebrew clubs will brew outside of their social meetings and then they'll all come together and taste each other's beers and judge them that way. We have kind of flipped that to where we all brew at the same time, and then when we come back to brew again is when we taste the creations that we've all made. Very roasty. It got rid of a lot of plateaus that a lot of brewers reach when you brew on your little island and you're just doing it um, all by yourself in your garage or in your kitchen. The club started about 10 years ago because we wanted to start entering some competitions and getting some feedback for our beer. Quite honestly, we used it as a tool at first to find out if we were even making decent beer. This wall of awards offers a pretty clear answer to that question. In 2010, Mecca took home the Gambrinus Club Award at the National Homebrew Competition, cementing them as one of the top homebrew clubs in the country. And as soon as you start winning some ribbons and getting some recognition and some name recognition, others who have similar thoughts, similar backgrounds, they just kind of gravitate towards you. So, from the four original members, Mecca has blossomed. We never thought that we would be more than four guys. It, it, was, it was quite by surprise when other people would contact us and say, hey, can we come out and brew with you guys? And we're like, sure. We've sort of become a melting pot for brewers in, in central Indiana. We attract brewers who are professional brewers, and we attract uh, the new guy who's just getting started. They come out and, and learn what they can, and if they keep coming back, then they're in Mecca. The camaraderie of it's really nice, you know, obviously, drinking beer with everybody, evaluating each other's beers, and just hanging out. I mean, usually it is by myself in my basement, and I, I mean, I turn up the music, but it's, uh, lonely is the wrong word, but it's, it's different. It's, it's a lot more fun to brew with people. The people are what make this day very special to me, and, and I wouldn't miss a homebrew day for, for anything. And um, It's my day off, but this is relaxing, and this is what I'm passionate about. Nothing's more exciting to me than sharing my homebrew with somebody and, and seeing them enjoy it too, so that's why I do it. I think joining a club is one of the most important things to do if you want to be a homebrewer and you want to uh, get better at the craft. And, uh, and learn it, you can get a lot of help from other guys. Welcome back to lesson three. Hopefully you're sitting there um, and you've been inspired by all your learning about craft beer and you're thinking, how can I make beer at home? 
Um, the great news is that you don't have to be a professional brewer, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, you don't even have to be a chemist to make beer at home. Your local homebrew shop is going to have a kit um, complete with some plastic pails, a carboy, bottle capping equipment, brushes for cleaning, which is extremely important, um, yeast, malts, malt extracts, all the different pieces that you need to put together and start crafting beer at home. So if you've got a stock pot and a stove, you're ready to get going. When it comes to water, um, you're not going to want to use your basic tap water. Spring water is going to be good. If your tap water tastes like rust or tastes funny, your beer at the end is going to taste funny. One of the nice things about kits is that they have taken the combining water and grain together and made an extract. So you've got a malt extract kit that you can combine with water in a stock pot, boil, and then add your hops that are provided in order to balance out those flavors. And from there, you'll cool that product down and add it to one of the fermentation vessels which is where you're going to add yeast. Primary fermentation, which is going to take a week to two weeks, is going to happen in a plastic pail, most traditionally. The fermentation portion is where cleanliness becomes very, very, very important. You're pretty much a glorified janitor at this point in time, but up till now you boiled everything. So at this point, you've got cool fermentation that's going to be happening, and any speck of dirt, dust, debris, those types of things are going to cause your beer to have off flavors. So you want to be very careful, be very stringent about your cleaning and sanitation, because you're spending a lot of time and a little bit of money, and you're putting a lot of effort in, and you want to make sure that you make the best quality product that you can. After you've gone through your fermentation and you move it into bottles and bottle condition it, after a month or so you're going to end up with a couple of cases of beer that you made that you can kick back with your friends and crack open, share with people and be proud of the work that you put in. Now that you've seen our three lessons and you've learned a little bit more about what makes beer, how to cook with beer and how to get started crafting your own beer, get out and start enjoying some beer. Cheers. I like brewing beer because of the science that goes into it, of the work that goes into it. But probably the biggest reason I like brewing beer is to see the look on people's faces when they try it. I like beer, uh, in brewing in particular, um, for a lot of reasons. And it all started with my very first batch of homebrew. The more I brewed, I got into the, the labor of it. And brewing, especially on the pub level, is still a very laborious, hands-on thing. It's an outlet, it's a cathartic, you know, I get in the brewery and I just feel relaxed. This love of brewing drove DJ and Darren to fulfill what may be every homebrewer's dream, opening a brewery of their own. And they are not alone. We are, as a state, opening a lot of new breweries every day. Um, we're at 34, I believe, right now, probably projecting 40 by the end of the year. The market is so small right now that we're just looking at growth and that's it. So the more the merrier for us right now. And for the new guys, there are options. Black Swan in Plainfield is more of a traditional brew pub. Currently a family style restaurant with a brewery which will open soon. We started the restaurant first because uh, we had a goal, right? We're always going to be a restaurant before we're a brewery. Our brewery licensing is on track to take about 95 days. Um, you know, rather than put that at the front end and have it be a bottleneck for us opening in general, we knew that we were in a good position to open the restaurant and start getting the buzz and getting people acclimated to what we're doing first. Beer Brewery in Indianapolis is a small production facility. The only way to get their beer is up close and in person. I kind of took the approach of what I do best is make beer and I would rather focus completely on that rather than having to split my attention between food and beer. I love the variety of beers that are available all over the world, the different styles, um, and I wanted to bring that to Indianapolis. Customers are welcome to come in and sample the beer for free, and then uh, you know, usually they walk out with two to four or five growlers at a time. And although the business models are different, the reception has been the same. We opened up the day before Thanksgiving. We had a line out our door for three hours. 
Um, it was unbelievable. We've had a spectacular reception from, uh, from the residents, especially those in neighborhoods right behind us. We take our, our customers that are excited about us and we try to keep them excited, pumped up and ready for their next trip in. <laughs>Festivals are entertainment vehicles of their own. I believe the whole notion of the beer festival is a modern construction that comes from the era when we've had choices. Because if you don't have choices, the whole idea of a beer festival makes very little sense. Festivals offer a chance for craft beer fans to come together and celebrate all things beer. From small gatherings like the one in Story to Winterfest here at the State Fairgrounds. As a guild, it's, it's, it's our goal to educate new beer drinkers. So you get the variety, you get the camaraderie, you get the connections. I think all that adds up to a pretty positive experience all the way around. And that's kind of our reasoning behind it. And, and, and they're really fun. And 30 minutes before doors open at Winterfest, the line outside tells the story. Indiana craft beer fans are an eager bunch. From the rookies. Pretty excited about it. We're going to have a few drinks. There are just so many. I, I don't know where to start when we get in there. To the veterans. I've also been to Summerfest. It's my favorite two days of the year. I'm really pumped to just drink some beer. <laughs> it's too cold. I need to drink some beer. <laughs> and at least one guy just hoping for tickets. I figure there's probably gonna be some angry girlfriend that doesn't wanna go inside and she'll sell me hers. They're all waiting for this moment. You can find just about any kind of beer at a festival. It can be a little overwhelming to the, um, the novice. I think if you're at a tasting event that you should really consider what you want to achieve. It, there should be some goals. So what I do is I'll go and say I want, I'm, I'm going to just do IPAs and, and ESBs this time. Especially at the bigger festivals, you can try 20 different kinds of IPAs and then you can really find out, you know, you, you really find that one beer that you really like. And whether you plan your attack or not, the variety of beer festivals throughout the year are a chance to find out for yourself what Indiana has to offer. Enjoy. Here in the 21st century, we've got almost three dozen breweries operating in the state of Indiana, more than any time since Prohibition. And I think it's a, a very, very exciting time to be in Indiana if you're a, a craft beer drinker or, or even someone who's just beer curious. It's hip, it's happening, and it's definitely happening in Indiana right now. Our goal isn't to make something that's clear that you can drink a whole bunch of and not taste like anything. Our goal is to brew something that you can taste, that delivers an experience, that pairs well with food across the state. We have fantastic, world-class beer.
I'm at a loss. What can I do? I can drink. For a DVD or Blu-ray disc of this program, or other WTIU-produced programs, go online at www.shopwtiu.org. Hi, I'm Anita Johnson, and thanks for watching. I hope to see you at an Indiana Craft Brewery or Brew Pub soon. Cheers!